Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day. My name is Herb. I'm an alcoholic. Welcome to our traditions series. Once a month, I believe it's the first Saturday of each month, for the first six months of this year. Then the second six months on the first Saturday, we'll do similarly with the concepts. Thank you, Mary Joseph Retreat Center for administering our workshops and uh, taking care of a lot of the Q and A's and the preparation for your enrollment. And uh, they've been very supportive of my work specifically, but generally all of the 12-step work in the community. Uh, Melissa is our host today. Perhaps you would like to say a few words, please. Greetings to all time zones present today. Welcome back. And welcome for those who have not been here. Uh, we are so happy and delighted to have you here today. My name is Melissa. I'm one of the hospitality members here at the Mary Joseph Retreat Center. And we were established in 1963 by the Daughters of Mary and Joseph. We were envisioned by the late sister Johanna Late, excuse me, Sister Mary Ignatius. She was able to rally funds to open this beautiful eight acre campus. So if you're ever in Southern California, this is a hidden gem. So please come and visit us. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce the man of the hour. Herb Kagan has been connected to the Mary Joseph Retreat Center for many years, and he is truly part of our family. His 12-step and centering prayer groups have been extremely popular at the Retreat Center for decades, and now since the start of the pandemic, he has moved these popular offerings to Zoom. Herb's journey includes the publication of three books on spiritual awakening, 37 years of active participation in a 12-step fellowship, 40 years in human resources consulting, graduate education in psychology, and seven years in Claritian Seminary. And I'm sure there's more to tack on to that list. So we are delighted that he is donating the proceeds to these Zoom gatherings to our retreat center during this difficult time. Thank you, Herb, and thank you everyone for your support. We appreciate it very much. Thanks, Melissa, very much. <laughs> She's right. The retreat center is an oasis here in the, in the uh, outer rim of Los Angeles. We're on a peninsula, and uh, so it's eight acres. It overlooks the sea on one side. It overlooks the city on the other side. It's, a, uh, an, it's an oasis, a spiritual oasis. All right, so... Let's pray the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Today, we're going to be talking about the traditions. So for the people who are new to this workshop today, this is a very different workshop for me in terms of the approach. It's not going to be a lot of teaching on my part. It was set up in the orientation in January for you to have some assignments and some resources and some uh, direction as to do some study work on your own with some worksheets <clears throat> that were available, that are available on my website. <clears throat> and uh, for you to do the reading and the studying and the reflecting and the writing. And then today, primarily, primarily, of course, I'll always do some teaching. That's just my nature. <clears throat> but primarily today, we'll be discussing your reading, your reflections, your writing, your questions, your experiences. Um, 
although I've done quite a bit of reading and research and workshops in the past on the traditions, I, I'm not an expert at all. Uh, I, I could say in the steps area that I'm actually an expert, but in the traditions area, I am not. And I just want to acknowledge that, that I'm going to really be a facilitator here. Uh, to uh, for us all to grow and to learn together. Uh, some of you have extensive experience in service within the 12-step fellowship structure, and I admire you. I, I don't have that experience. And as a result of your experience, you certainly have practical applications of the traditions, um, whether you have uh, a knowledge of them or not, you have a lot of practical experience of the application. So we look forward to having you share some of that too that's relevant to each of the traditions. The structure for these first six months is that we will look at three traditions a month now beginning here today, traditions one, two, and three. <clears throat> and then of course, next month, four, five, and six, etc. The final gathering in June will be a retrospective look at the journey that we've taken for the six months, the overall experience with the traditions itself, but also with the workshop, so that if there's some way that we can improve what we did, uh, then we'll incorporate that if, uh, if I ever do it again. Um, It said principles. The traditions are principles. Some of us know what that means. Some of us think we know what that means. <laughs> Some of us don't really have a clue as to what principle means itself and how does it connect to the traditions. I've ad adopted, adapted <clears throat> the set aside prayer for today. I would invite you to join me to have an open mind and an open heart in the spirit of we're, we're here in the classroom of the workshop to learn together. Please join me. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself, my principles, the 12 traditions, and you for an open mind and a new experience with myself, my principles, the 12 traditions, and especially you. So Bill was in a meeting with some folks back in 1940, 41, somewhere in there. The big book had just been published. Some guy up came up from Florida and he said, Bill, what, what, how are you going to avoid having the experience the Washingtonians had? And Bill said, with all humility, <laughs> who are the Washingtonians? Now, that's an amazing antidote. It's true, by the way. It's a true story. <clears throat> Because the Washingtonians, a hundred years earlier, almost to the year, this is 1941, 42, and 1840, 41, 42. A hundred years earlier, the Washingtonians had been started by a small group of people in a saloon who were tired of their drinking life. And they said, let's band together as a group and stop drinking and support one another. And they called themselves the Washingtonians because Washington was the founder of the country and they wanted to be the founders of this movement within the country. Within four years, they had 400,000 members. Now this is a time where there's no radio, television, social media. Think about it, 1840. And they got 400,000 members in four years. I'm contrasting that with Bill Wilson, who's sitting there in 1941 with probably 100 to 200 members after five years. 
And Bill had all the advantages of radio, telegraph, advanced and sophisticated communication, newspapers, etc. So the Washingtonians was a formidable group. Abraham Lincoln addressed the group. That's the kind of prestige it had in the country. And yet, Bill had never heard of it. And as he did his little research, he found that they had got distracted. They promoted personalities uh, to get the message out. They used newspapers and whatever else they could to promote personalities as salespeople for the program. And they said, wow, this has really worked well for alcohol. They all were sober. Why don't we uh, use it for slavery? Why don't we use it for women's rights? Why don't we use it for alcohol uh, prohibition? So they got very, very distracted with a lot of well-intentioned activities, but they all failed. And within 10 years, the group had disbanded. It was gone. So gone that Bill had never heard of it. And he had specialized by this time in studying alcohol and its history. So that's when he got the idea that he needed to create some type of guidelines, some type of guardrails. Those are two words I use, guidelines, guardrails, principles. We have a principle of physics, gravity, for instance. It's a law. It's not a regulation. I mean, you can violate gravity. You can do that. There will be consequences. And that's the same thing with any principle. That's what we mean by principle. Here, <clears throat> in, this, in the human use of it, we mean a core value, a law of nature. In physics, gravity is a really good example. <clears throat> There's principles in emotions, in human behavior. There seems to be some type of universal principles with regard to behavior. There will be consequences of dishonesty. So the principle is honesty. There will be consequences to infidelity. So the principle is fidelity. These are not written any place. These come up from our experience. And Bill talks about the traditions were developed on the anvil, hammered out on the anvil of experience. And what a great image, hammered out on the anvil. Think blacksmith. There's a lot of heat, a lot of pain, a lot of uh, learning from mistakes. The problem he was addressing was the group function. He talked about the steps, as his experience uh, revealed to him, were the mechanism, the methodology for the deflation of the personal ego at death. The steps published and, 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 and institutionalized in 1939 in the big book. They were for the deflation of the ego at depth. They, they introduced us to principles. Page 60 says we practice, uh, 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 he, he uses the term progress, not perfection. And he talks about principles as a synonym for the steps coming out of the steps. And of course, step 12 says we practice these principles. I'm talking about the principles that are inherent to and embedded in each of the steps in all our affairs. <clears throat> Those, that was the problem for personal living. He's applying these principles for group function. <clears throat> so 1939, he codified them in the big book. And as he began thinking about them and writing about them, he published them in the grapevine, one at a time, mid-40s, 1940s, uh, until <clears throat> finally they met in 1950 at the first annual conference of AA, 
the international conference now and ratified the 12 traditions. <clears throat> the total purpose of the traditions was unity in the group. Think in terms of the body. Each one of us, <laughs> I don't want to be so obvious, but I want to be simple. And I want to create an, an image and a metaphor that just captures how this works. The traditions, unity. We have a body. Now, we have two arms. We have two ears. We have two eyes. Each of them have different functions. They're all parts of the body. This is a wonderful metaphor for the traditions. The traditions are addressing the entire body the, of uh, the fellowship. And each group is one of the members and each member is part of the group. And if we think about what's the unifying force within the body, and each one of us will have an opinion about that. Those of you who are religious will call it the soul. Those of you who are scientific will call it the animating force, the life force. Whatever it is, that allows us to be alive and whatever it is that leaves us when in fact the corpse is there, that's what we're talking about, that unifying force. Then each one of us will have an opinion about that. If we keep in mind unity, what's the primary purpose of the traditions? The unity of the group itself within the group, the individual group, but also the unity amongst the groups. So that in your area, you have dozens of groups, but your home group is your primary area for your support. But how do you have communication and harmony amongst the groups. We have guidelines and guardrails. We don't have laws or regulations. Bill said we don't need any laws or regulations. There's only two disciplines in Alcoholics Anonymous. This is a fabulous comment. There's only two disciplines in Alcoholics Anonymous. One is God and one is alcohol. We, we, could, we could broaden it to be inclusive for all of the fellowships. There's only two disciplines. And, and for the potential agnostic or atheist, light or darkness. Higher power or, addi or addiction. It's totally binary. And Bill said, we're going for one or we're going for the other. Notice, or. There's no pause here. There's no resting place. And I like that, and you've heard it if you've been around me at all, the dimmer switch analogy. That dimmer switch is either going up toward the light or it's going down toward the darkness and it doesn't stop. It doesn't rest. There is no neutral. And so I use the mental image of people on the path like you are. I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here because who does what you're doing right now? Take a Saturday to spend some time to talk about or listen to the traditions. Good Lord. <clears throat> people who are really interested in their personal recovery and well-being as well as potentially the group's recovery and well-being. So the image is pressed gently up against it, pressed gently. There's no violence here, just gentle. There's no rules here. There's no regulations here. There's no laws here. Just gently lean into the dimmer switch, moving it forward a notch at a time. 
Well, the same can be said of the 12 concepts, which we'll look at in uh, beginning in July. You know, they're very different purpose. They're really the guidelines, the guardrails, the principles for the life of a nonprofit spiritual organization. If you ever want to, and if you join us for that segment of this year, the, the second half of this year, you will see Bill's brilliance beyond what you've seen in the steps and the traditions. Genius, the 12 concepts. Even, there's even job descriptions and organizational structure. But that's for a later time. <clears throat> Step 12 says we practice these principles in all our affairs, in living our personal life. We practice these principles that are manifest in the 12 steps. Of course, chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11 represent that. Principles in every aspect of our life, our significant relationship, our family, our work, our community, and our fellowship. Today, I'd like to really have you make comment about the traditions as applicable to your group, but I'm actually more interested in your application of or experience with translating those traditions into principles for living your life, your personal life and your social life. This workshop is very different than the majority of my workshops where I do a lot of teaching. I won't do a lot of teaching in these workshops. Of course, I'm warming us up, giving us a platform here and orientation to what we're going to do today and each of the days uh, for the balance of the year. You have assignments. <clears throat> now, those of you who perhaps weren't there in January, didn't know about this approach and didn't have these assignments and didn't know to go to the website. And that's just what is. You can catch up if you want to, but there's a list of assignments for each of the traditions. And they come out of the anvil of my experience of doing workshops on a personal basis, a physical basis, 20 years ago, after I had completed the steps for the third time, I got interested in the traditions. This is 1994, 2000, right in that area. <clears throat> and I, I actually engaged the man to be a tradition sponsor. And he took me through each of the traditions. And he's the one that introduced me to these assignments. Essentially, I've obviously fine-tuned them based on my knowledge and my experience with doing them. And then I conducted <clears throat> some workshops myself. In 2014, I think it was, it sounds like just recently, but my goodness, that was eight years ago. <clears throat> um, I did take the time to do a uh, three month workshop on a weekly basis on the traditions, which was recorded and edited. And um, <clears throat> that is also available to you now on YouTube, a podcast audio. Uh, podcast on the mm, each of the traditions so you're that's a resource available to you you may not have known that I think that podcast was just made available this week also um, and uh, it would be about an hour each of the traditions would be an hour where I do a deep dive into a teaching on from my research and my experience on each of the traditions. So that would be something that you would want to uh, take a look, uh, a listen to if you're interested in uh, that, uh, that information. The key information that I would recommend as a basic, just this is a minimum. I mean, there's so much rich information on the 
traditions, but the, the, the basic assignment would be to read the 12 and 12. That, that's really simple. It's right there. It doesn't take a lot of research. <laughs> if you have the AA 12 and 12, there are 12 chapters on the traditions, one for each tradition. And they're short. I mean, three pages to five pages. And they give a little history and they give the spirit of it and they give the application of it. In addition to that basic text and document, there's a Traditions Illustrated put out by the General Service Office. And that was distributed to everybody, at least that we had registered. It's on my website. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Rainey has done something like she talked about in putting it in the chat. Uh, I don't have a technology uh, facility, so I may be awkward in my vocabulary, but you get the spirit of it. The point is the 12 and 12 and the traditions illustrated would be very, very basic tools to accompany this you in this journey. Uh, and then if you wanted to expand that, listen to the podcast. There are worksheets that have been distributed. If you're newer to the workshop, you can find them on the website. Uh, I suspect that Rainey has also put those in the chat so that you could access, access those if you want to. And what I mean by worksheets is it asks some questions. What did I read or hear? What does it mean? How does it apply to me? No, they're basic questions and they're just like, there's no right or wrong answer, but they're prompters to lead you to be conscious when you're reading and, 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 and then picking up some of the information and the experiences that gives you an experience, especially what is the principle of the particular tradition that you're looking at. It may have been distributed. Sometimes I lose track of what we've done and it may not be, but it's on the website. Any, most of this material is on the website. <clears throat> um, and some of it's been distributed, but there is a list on, on the website of the principles and some of it will be distributed if it hasn't been distributed already um, after uh, this workshop, uh, Rainey's all locked and loaded to, to make sure that you have uh, the material that you need, probably more than you need. <laughs> There's a checklist that's put out by GSO, which is really helpful. It's a list of questions to challenge you with regard to each of the traditions. A, a long list of questions. Now, there's not a right or wrong answer. These questions are meant to confront you as to uh, your approach to your own group. And then you can personalize it by making it uh, relevant to your own personal life. That's the orientation uh, that I wanted to have as a priming the pump for us today, as we now look at each of the traditions. So I plan on spending about 30 minutes on each of the traditions. We have three traditions today and uh, opening it up to comments, questions, and sharing of experience, one tradition at a time. We're gonna look at uh, tradition one. And uh, I would like to read the um, short form of the tradition. Our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. Now I just made a comment, the short form. There is a long form. It's in the fourth edition of the big book. If you uh, don't have the short and long form, they're both now in the big book. Um, <clears throat> And uh, obviously they're in the 12 and 12. They're also on the assignment sheets 
both the short form and the long form, just to remind you at each tradition. So read those before you fill out, obviously, the answers to the questions. Allow those short and long forms to guide you after you have done the reading of the 12 and 12 and or the mm, illustrated. The illustrated is uh, like a cartoon thing, but it, it's very pictorial. It's very relevant. It's not childish at all. It's uh, just a, a very visual aid to help us uh, understand the spirit of, maybe not necessarily the uh, literal meaning of, but certainly the spirit of each of the traditions. And think about it in terms of the application for the uh, group, your own home group, assuming that you have a home group. There's a huge recommendation, endorsement for having a home group. What does that mean? A home group is the group that you normally go to regularly. You're pretty committed to. I have a home group. It was my very first meeting that I ever went to. Fortunately, it's right next to my house a mile away. <clears throat> it's a men's stag. And I, unless I'm occupied with a family event and or out of town, I'm at that meeting. Fortunately, it's now on Zoom. And so I can accommodate even making it when I'm out of town, if uh, I have that time. In the uh, Traditions Illustrated, there's a comment by Bill Wilson about the, the traditions. He said, they're a guide to better ways of working and living. I just love that. The traditions are a guide to a better way of working and living. The steps are applicable, essentially, and that's their purpose to our personal life, the traditions to our group life. But I'm inviting you, maybe even challenging you, to apply those traditions to your personal life. There's a woman in al in Arkansas, Mary Pearl, who has really done an incredibly good job, I believe, in using the traditions in their personal life, especially in their family and their relationships. So if you have any uh, opportunity to look at her work, Mary Pearl, <clears throat> uh, she does just a really wonderful job. The whole point of the steps and you if you've been exposed to me at all, especially step three, know the word alignment. It's not in the big book, but it's the word I use as the key to understanding the purpose of the 12 steps. For me to be in alignment. Now, you could get, uh, you know, traditional and say alignment with God's will. I'm pretty non-traditional because I really want to be all inclusive. And I say alignment with reality, alignment with life. The steps are for me to be in alignment with reality, for me to be in alignment with life. And the traditions are the same. To bring harmony within my life is the purpose of the steps, to bring harmony within my social life the purpose of the traditions. Once again, the animating force, that word has a lot of power if you understand the where it comes from, anima. Anima is the Latin for soul, for spirit, for life force. Animation. We give life force to cartoons, animation. Anima, animating the body is the life force that gives us the ability to grow and to know and to take action and to make decisions, to take care of ourselves and then to take care of other people in the healthy sense. Bill said the steps are an antidote to self-will and the of the person, of the individual. 
And the traditions are the antidote to the self-will of the group. Because the group is just a reflection of the individual. That's why I use that body concept uh, in terms of the unity of the traditions. Wholeness, integration. These are the words that reflect the purpose of the traditions. <clears throat> In the 12 and 12, I believe it says that unity is the principle underlying the first tradition, unity. I'm moving on now to talk specifically about tradition one. We'll spend about 30 minutes on each at the, uh, uh, I'm going to ask you to share your knowledge and your experience and your questions about each of the traditions uh, now as we go through it. Um, and I'll monitor it to keep about 30 minutes for each. <clears throat> and um, so we're looking at tradition one now. And uh, Bill says that the tradition one is, principle is unity and all, all 11 of the other traditions is to support unity. I mean, that's an insight. That really helps us understand <clears throat> that the principle of every tradition is unity, but different aspects of it. Melody Beattie in her book on Codependent No More talked about healthy emotional development, maturity as a balance of the individual and, uh, and, and, and the social needs in, in these two terms. This captures balance in the sense of the codependency, balance in the sense of emotional sobriety, balance in the sense of emotional maturity. Independence, independence, my personal independence and my personal interdependence. That's what we're talking about here. The traditions are for the management, if you will, regulation of the group itself, but then the group amongst the groups, independence of the group, but the interdependence of the group. Balance. A relationship of humility. Sacrificing individuality for the better part of the group. Bill talked about obedience to spiritual principles as the antidote to personality, principles before personalities. It's interesting, the word obedience comes again from the Latin word, obedere. I don't want to be fancy or sophisticated, but these, uh, looking at the root, roots of the words, where did they come from, really reveal the spirit of the word, obedere. In Latin means to listen. It doesn't mean obedience. Obedere means to listen. And yet the word obedience does, of course, mean some sort of cooperation. But that listening, that's really the important signal here in terms of uh, the traditions. Listening to the group. I'm looking at my notes. I have some other things here, but I don't want to do a lot of teaching at this point. I want to do a, a lot of uh, facilitating of, uh, of uh, your questions and your observations uh, from your own uh, reading and experience, especially of, uh, of application of the traditions. And then I perhaps can make some more comments um, from my notes uh, as we go forward. Thanks, Herb. I, um, I'm really grateful for the workshop. And my focus and my purpose for taking the workshop was to um, improve and use the traditions in my family, in, yeah. my, in, my, 
in my family and in my personal relationships and groups. Um, and I, um, in, and I did, I didn't get to all the homework I did at the readings. But of, course, of course, thank you. Yeah, Good. Yeah. I, mean, I hope you hear the spirit of that. You know, yeah. this is, this is not a, 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 an experience where you'll get a grade or that you graduate. No, no, no. This is a cumulative. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. So I've been in recovery for, oh gosh, 20 plus years. First came to recovery as a, a you know, what I affectionately call black belt codependency. And you mentioned Melody Beatty. My first working of the steps was the 12 step guide for codependence. And um, that just opened me up to where I am today. Nice. Yeah. Um, but um, one that of touched, the- That touched you, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, this is like, I'm just remembering where I was. I could, I could hear it, I could see it. It was wonderful. That's right. It cracks us open. Go ahead, please. Yeah, and remembering where I was to, to 24 years ago now versus exactly. where I am today. Yeah. And um, the, this specifically on Tradition One, where it talks about um, unity. Uh, after doing the writing, uh, answering these questions, that one of the things that you know really came over me was how I was raised in a dysfunctional family, not horrible people, but very dysfunctional um, alcoholic family, and um, and I was raised to believe that the family was the most important thing, and um, in my what blew when my life blew up in front of my face. I, and I got into recovery, I realized that I was willing to sacrifice myself and all the individuals mm. just to keep this illusion. Well, there you go. Family. Yeah. Yeah. Sacrifice has a lot of implications. And again, I'm going to go to the Latin. Uh, bear with yeah. me. It's a sac the word, because it's such a, a critical concept in the traditions. Um, in fact, I have a whole uh, 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 sheet of that gives some insight into the each of the traditions where at each tradition there is a sacrifice of some individual component you may have that or you will have that um it, the word sacrifice comes from the latin two words sacer s-a-c-e-r and facere f-a-c-e-r-e sacer means holy priestly sacred Fachere means to make. Sacrifice, literally in the ancient traditions, was a way of honoring and appeasing, unfortunately, appeasing the gods. So it has a real, uh, how would you say, restorative connotation here. When we talk about sacrifice, we're not talking about punishment. We're talking about bringing some sense of fullness and wholeness to the person. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're the That's first. Okay. <laughs> well, what I thought was so uh, wonderful in doing the homework on this one was how today I realized that, um, and I learned only through the 12, my 12 step work in um, with the traditions and with my meetings and at different times that um, the importance of this is that um, let's see, I want, how do I formulate this? Um, I've been in dysfunctional meetings and was able to practice the tradition. And I've, I've learned that I have a choice. I can walk away from an, un, a, an unhealthy meeting that's unhealthy to me and I can go someplace else or I could stay and, um, but in early recovery, those were only my choices. I either had to stay in the dysfunction or cut it out, you know, cut myself off. In early. In early, in early recovery. That was, those were my only choices. What are your choices now? Well, today, this, I can apply this principle of humility, that I'm one of a group of really awesome people who are, we're all, you know, we're all human and we all are sick and 
And um, it's not my job to save my family. And I don't have to cut them out of my life because I don't agree with all of their life choices. I think it's a very balanced approach because in early recovery, you don't have the skills and the resources to deal with dysfunction. But later on, when you have some conversion yourself, some substance yourself, you can stay in a meeting and be part of a solution rather than be subjected to the problem. Yeah, I love that. That's a great distinction. Well, one of the things that I realized with my own behavior was um, that in a in a in a, in in my AA or FA meetings, I can I can see I can see people, you know, I can accept people people's weirdness or and just know that oh, they're just having a bad day today, or well, yeah, I know that person's kind of sick right now. That you know, I it's like I accept them where they're at and I don't take anything they say or do personally right and and I trust that the group will be fine and so and so will be fine and what and with my family I realize where I where I shoot myself in the foot is where I keep hanging on or what I shouldn't say hang on to when I go back to try to play this you know super mom or matriarch of the family who's going to save everybody and not you know help them not make the mistakes i've made in my life and and just you know to back away and just you use the word reality alignment with reality accept reality that like my children my my nieces and nephews they're all you know in their 30s 40s and 50s they're growing up and how can I expect them to have the wisdom of a 70 year old and they're not even in recovery. So, I mean, it's like, trust that they have a God and it's not me, you know, and this, this tradition kind of helped me with that as far as writing about the humility. You know, if I realize that I'm one of many, I'm just one of many. That's what humility actually means. It's a perspective. Yeah. I am the center of my life. That's the truth but I am not the center of life. That's the delusion. Yeah. And you can now with the time that you have in a 12 step program and the work that you've done, you can adopt the code that Bill tells us is our code in step 10, love and tolerance. Love and tolerance. Yeah. You can't do that in early recovery because you don't got it. Well, what I really appreciate and I'm so grateful for today is knowing that I don't have to cut my family out of my life. Right. That I can still be a part of this family. To the extent that you can. And if you find that it becomes something that you cannot somehow adopt to or adjust to, then you just leave it for a time. And yeah. Yeah, but you're realistic about the balance between your connection to yourself and your connection to your family. Yeah, this last year or last two years has become especially painful because national politics, the pandemic and uh, vaccine versus no vaccine (laughs) has just really created. And um, so I'm like really wanting these traditions more than ever yeah. to help to be a part of the solution, not yeah. a part of the problem. I guess that's what it is. Well, I think that that's, that's almost an operating principle that would be very healthy to hold in a meeting. Treat the meeting as a sacred space, as a, a healing space. And yet uh, you can use judgment that uh, if, there's something that's irremediable that you cannot contribute to that you are realistic about that. Yeah. 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 But be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And if you have to walk away, then do that. But it's much better for seniors like ourselves who have some time and some wisdom, hopefully, to be there in a loving and tolerant way to be part of the solution and to help lead, to help lead literally by our role modeling uh, the group to a more uh, healthy uh, environment. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much.
traditions have become so much more important to me over the last two or three years. And it was spoken about just now um, in the last couple of years. So many things have come up that have been so controversial right. that no place in our groups, but because we're human beings <laughs> that have been brought into the groups, a lot of 10th tradition stuff, first, second, fourth, but um, that it's become really vital. It's like we've had another compressed sort of thing where this is the microcosm, you know, of the whole world in our little groups. And, it's a really, know, really good insight, by the way. I hope people are hearing that, that there's never been a more important time to really um, uh, understand and embrace the traditions. I'm really glad that you're making that point because the, the world is thawing out and we're going to come back to normal sometime this year, I do believe, whatever normal means. And so I think that's a wonderful insight. Thank you. Go ahead and I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, yeah, but I do want to support that. Yeah, I just, it, it's just so funny because there's, you can, you can take this out really far. I mean, I think AA is the ultimate democracy and we're looking at uh, all kinds of things on on the grand scale and when we bring it down to hey you guys we have to be in this together so whatever super important thing that we know we're absolutely right about we still have to set that aside because we're all on this ship together and if part of us goes down we can all go down and then we don't have the whole entity to keep us individually sober if we don't have that and i um i just think it's 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 vital that we um consider when we're when we're when we're having these very very strong feelings they're valid they're all valid in the outside world yeah. but we have to put them outside the rooms nice. when we come in and and when it comes to things like say you know, there's a law in the state or something. The law comes before AA. You know, we have to, we're, that's where humility comes in. We have to have humility. Yeah. We're not more important than other people. And our common welfare comes first. And yeah. I love that because that puts my selfishness and my self-righteousness aside. And, uh, or it tries to. And, uh, and yeah. then we all get to group together and band together and stay, keep this wonderful, wonderful program afloat. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments, and they really support what's said also in the sense of humility is a perspective, and, and, and the way you just articulated it, that's the perspective. On page 14, Bill uses the term sacrifice, uh, 14 and 15. At the very bottom, the very last line, he says, for if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice, for others. That's the whole point. I sacrifice my individual personality for the principles and the good of the whole. Now, there's a balance here. We're not talking about martyrdom. We're not talking about right. uh, suppression of the individual. But what you had said is about perspective and humility. And you talked about uh, being right. And that that's an unfortunate uh, human quality. All of us have it. Um, but the challenge that I give myself is, do I want to be right or do I want to be helpful? And, and helpful, all, if, I'm, if I'm fit, helpful always wins. I want to be helpful. And it keeps it really simple. I look through the lens. Is this going to be helpful, this word, this action, this attitude? What's going to be helpful? So I really appreciate your comment. So there's an issue that's come up in my group. And um, somebody raised the issue. And what I've learned through being in a particular individual's big book workshop <laughs> is when I have a strong emotion, I got to look at that. Like when someone brings something to, to the group and it makes me immediately have a, a strong feeling, um, you know, this first principle of unity, what I do is I look at that person's point of view as if my life depends upon it. 
Mm. Like, because their ability to bring whatever they need, the only requirement is that, you know, in Ellen, that we've been affected by alcoholism. So I looked at it and, and what ended up happening is I realized that what he brought to the group had to do with the position I was in and that I hadn't gained clarity on something <laughs> and what it would mean. And I had actually put myself personally um, at risk on behalf of the group, but the group didn't ask for that, you know, <laughs> and I would have to take action that was in my best interest and in the group's best interest because and when I spoke to my sponsor, I was like, but I don't want to do this. Like when I don't want to bring up a tradition, like when I don't want to bring up a tradition and I also don't want to like correct when we, we do a 10 step, you know, we'll continue to take personal inventory and when we're wrong, personally admit it. And that means I have to change my behavior. So if, if I've, you know, in, I signed up for a service on behalf of the group and I realized that I clicked terms and conditions and I wasn't we weren't in agreement with the terms and conditions. And so I had to take action. And um, it really reminded me of all my different positions over the years where, you know, for so many years, I would bring out the traditions to defend or argue, you know, to defend or argue. Like, how am I going to, I'm going to get attacked. Like, I've got to be ready for anything. Like, let me know all the rules. And then to argue against why that other person's wrong and the awakening I had, and it just brought me to tears is I am doing this. And then, and the way I showed up for myself, it made me so incredibly sad. You know, I put myself at financial risk is what it was. And I had, I lost my life savings to um, the alcoholic in my life, you know, like, and that was also my choice, mm. you know, but I, what the crying and emotionality that came up is I care about myself and I'm doing these traditions because I cherish myself and I respect others. It's not because, you know, and um, then I just started thinking about how the groups exist. And then I thought about how I was able to walk into a door and no one else in my family did. How did that happen? Like, how am I here? Like these traditions is, are what kept these groups growing all these years. Like the importance of them and the beauty of them. And, um, and then it also gave me this huge, the real thing that came out of it was, so as far as it relates to my family, I got a, an email from my brother and it was not kind, <laughs> but instead of arguing back, I <laughs> wrote, I'll keep that in mind. I love you. <laughs> like, nice. Nice. <laughs> nice. But see, there, that's a, you took the high road there. You just took the, you responded, you didn't challenge, you didn't correct. That was, that's really a model of what I say to my, the men I try to help <clears throat> identify the principle, always take the high road and be generous. Yeah. And then the other thing that made me really see everything is for Al-Anon's. You know, Al-Anon's so sneaky because we don't realize what issues we have when we walk in the door. We think we're coming in as a favor to somebody else, you know? Right. And so I think it's the fact that we don't have to say, I'm Ashley and I'm an Al-Anon. And even that word, it's like, I'm, I'm a, Ashley and I'm addicted to approval. Like, <laughs> right. I'm Ashley and I'm addicted to control. I'm, you know, whatever it is, I'm addicted to anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I realized I have a case. I'm OD. This is the term that I came through in my writing. I'm in obsession and then I'm in dis disassociation, delusion, denial, and distraction. That is my Al Anon disease. I OD. And how do I know I OD? Well, I track my sleep. I'm not sleeping. I'm not eating properly. I'm not present. And the real like come to Jesus moment happened is when I was, because of my obsession of this group issue, which has happened, you can just name any issue. 
I mean, I could have spoken to a, a clerk in a way that I, you know, it could be anything. Um, but this particular issue, how it affects me, how it affects the group, it will be a lot of work because it will be a lot of work for the groups to do things properly. Um, and it won't make it easy now for everybody. And so the thing that I realized was um, when I was, I hadn't been sleeping properly and I was getting the groceries out of my car with a couple dogs in my hand on the side of PCH. And I let go of one of the leashes, you know? And the dog ended up being okay. But the day I came in to Al-Anon for the very first time was because I caught a baby that the alcoholic had dropped. And so I just saw very clearly how my obsession and disease thinking could have cost an innocent being its life, you know, because I wasn't fully present. I, I was elsewhere. And so that was the whole thing that kind of came together. And then just also that I'm able to really see what the Al-Anon disease is, like really, really see what the obsessive thinking does. And then just come back to the relief of, I don't have to figure this out. There's a path, there's a community, there's, um, you know, I have a sponsor now. And, and like after having not had one for a little bit and um, there's a way. And these traditions give me so much freedom to get out of my al obsessive thinking. So that's it. Well, two words that you used I want to endorse also. I mean, thank you for your sharing. <clears throat> and I, I know there's a lot of story underneath what you're sharing um, is respect and cherish. Those were two words I got out of Dr. Gray's book, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. And, and he said, men want respect and women want to be cherished. Men want respect from men and women, but women from their partner really want to be cherished. And you use those two terms in the same sentence. And I'm, I'm thinking that that's, those are the two words in a relationship. I want to respect myself, but I want to cherish my partner. That word is so juicy. And, and, and so challenging when I read that and then I began applying that those were the lenses through which I looked at my wife to cherish her every every time I went to speak I said is this going to cherish her and of course it cut out half my conversation but <laughs> but it was a wonderful litmus test of my thoughts my words and my behavior so I thank you for sharing those yeah and that's probably why I said I have to cherish myself and yeah. respect you which is which oh. you just reflected in that that yeah. balance and yeah. that it's it's ultimately up to me like the last thing I'll say on the unity that came up for me it's so essential that I'm doing step 11 every day because First, I have to get unified within so that I well, can come. You, you know, you're speaking to my heart when you say that, that step 11, the consciousness, this is for me, this is the single most important piece of yeah. our own personal living is to be as conscious as possible. Now, there's lots of moving parts to that, but the key and the bullseye part of that is to practice consciousness. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, all right. This is Herb, uh, real quick, one thing you've said too is don't make anyone wrong, which has been super helpful to me. Thanks. <laughs> well, okay, sure, exactly. Um, that that goes back to that. I every every one of us wants to be right. Some of us really need to be right, and some of us actually take it to the level of being righteous. And I'm not. That's no. There's no compliment in that. <laughs> that that's a that's not a that's not helpful to be righteous <clears throat> so yeah that's right and um to be helpful and to be healthy personally healthy and socially helpful those are the two h words <laughs> thank you and just uh i loved how you translated the latin for listen, it takes last weekend on the emotional sobriety workshop. Yes. The watchword was pay attention. Yeah. Pay attention. And that's the invitation here 
to me and and um, the uh, the we we're not I'm not familiar with Mary Pearl, but we've done a lot of work comparing the traditions to the steps, which are analogs to me. And uh, that's the, another the, insight, though. I want to highlight that. I think there's there's a real help. Uh, a helping insight tool perspective to try to match up each of the steps with each of the traditions. Uh, I, I do believe, uh, and you use the term analog, I'm not even sure what it means, but there certainly is a connect, I think, uh, 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 organic connection between each of the steps and each of the traditions. Yes. And to me that the unity of the first tradition is contingent on the people in the group having that mutual surrender and that identity of something outside of this program kick my uh, butt. Yeah, so yeah. I'm willing to listen and participate. And you, you mentioned humility, which I agree, martyred, you know, so humility, I think you said last week, is staying right size. And um, martyrdom, I mean, I could be a narcissist or a martyr too. I mean, both of those are a lack of humility and both of those I've been in a group. And, uh, you know, again, that's the, to me, the, uh, I, we've all had mutual destruction. And so I'm here to help. I'm here to try to pay attention, to try to participate without losing my mind and becoming a despot. You know, Bill talks later about the uh, bleeding deacons, right. uh, becoming a despot or, you know, a martyr. So really profound. This is good stuff. Thank wonderful, you. wonderful. Well, listen to your wife, Paul. Okay, yes, so. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much, yeah, right. Very grateful to be with all of you today. So I'm looking at tradition one and um, where I find myself is, is some not mutual relationships. And, you know, my nobody I know in my immediate family is, is um, interested in 12-step recovery. And, you know, I, I look at it as I do this, I look at our common welfare and I look at, you know, how can I be a part of the group, a part of them, but yet they're, I mean, it's none of my business, of course, but they're not practicing the traditions. They don't even know what a tradition is unless it's a holiday meal. All right. So do you have a question? I do. Like, what do you do? About what? Just about life in general when you're the only one that's practicing or has any knowledge of the traditions so i really i'm not getting what your question is what do you do i mean you live your life according to principles and you ignore other people why okay yeah that's that's my they're, answer they're none of your business well yes that that is that is true i mean that just took the the wind out of the fire that I had in my belly. Um, so, oh, so just, how's your Al-Anon program? Uh, not too good. Um, but yeah, yeah, not not too good. And and uh, that just shows that yeah. shows where there's a crack. I think it's very interesting, also that, um, and I'd like you to expand a little bit more if you could on this organic relationship between the steps and the traditions. Um. <clears throat> I, I, well, it, for me, it, it's uh, an invitation to explore. Uh, it's not something I'm going to uh, make comment on or teach right now, but I, I saw immediately what Paul was talking about, and that is there seems to be some relationship. And it, it helped me explore because I have a deep understanding and knowledge of and experience with the steps. So then it helped me explore the traditions coming from an open mind, not saying like, that's what Bill had in mind. I'm not saying that at all. But is there some type of an organic relationship uh, between the steps and the traditions? And it appears to be. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems to me with step one and tradition one, step one is we're powerless over whatever the addiction is. And, we're, and tradition one is we're powerless over other people, it seems. Well, now, isn't that an answer to your question? Well, no, I, now that you mention it again, uh, you're, you're really good with the gut punches today, Herb. 
<laughs> thanks so uh, much. I can't, for- I can't avoid a setup like that. Well, right. Thanks. Thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for pricking the balloon here. Um, <laughs> the ego will humbly walk off the stage now. <laughs> but, but see, but see, underneath. Yeah, I'm glad you kept the sense of humor about it. But underneath, what we just talked about is you. Are, you already know the truth. You just couldn't see it until we began to verbalize it. And there's the benefit of the group. There's the benefit of sponsor relationship. There's the benefit of having social contact is that we can say it out loud. And if you have a really good friend, they're going to mirror back and not just co-sign. They're going to sort of like help you see the truth. And you are that good friend. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you so much for your help. I appreciate it. Yes, yes. Many- Quick thing first, I just wanted to thank Herb and acknowledge the amazing work that he um, facilitated for me and my partner in uh, his recent big book study program. And in short, without getting in, into any story, it created helped us create more space in our relationship such that after five years, we have just purchased a home together. Oh, wow. So he, and we've never lived together. So it's a huge step oh. in the direction of unity, wow. which is making me extraordinarily uncomfortable. <laughs> so there's that. And I have a specific thing about that that's sitting with me in my belly right now. Uh, in short, we bought a house with a pool. Mm-hmm. I have two older cats and a dog. Mm-hmm. I just learned this morning again that my uh, family member's dog drown in her pool oh sure mm-hmm. terrible mm-hmm. and i feel really sad about that my mom's cat drowned in a pool the point about all this is it's really important to me that as part of our common welfare should come first is for me to make sure that i'm creating a home with my partner that is a safe place for my whole family which includes my furry friends that's right um that's right yeah and it really matters to me and um, he's a little bit more price conscious, you know, conscious about money. Whereas for me, I can be honest and say that for me, I just know the devastation it would cause in my relationship with him, not to mention just, you know, how terrible it would be for me to lose a pet to a pool where I'm an adult in the room and know that right. elderly pets, unfortunately, commonly toddle into pools to their demise. Yeah. So, um, so that's up for us. And, um, and the challenge for me is, is staying in the dialogue and being humble in the dialogue. Yeah. Um, and there's my discomfort as an Al-Anon, which is part of me, the reason why it's such a stretch to partner and buy a home together and do this is because I am really good at making a decision. I personally can make a freaking decision and make sure that my personal pets are safe, for example. But now we have a shared, a shared decision-making yes. situation, um, which is, which I'm struggling with. And I'm scared to death about it. I have to be sure. honest. Sure. It's just a huge place of discomfort for me. Right. Yeah. And I'm, what I noticed in our, uh, his and our conversation today was, he had a solution about a fencing part of the yard rather than the pool. Of course, we've got lots of doors that open to the pool and we leave sure. doors open because people leave doors open. And my discom- what I feel, what I listened to today in our conversation was the concept of obedience. Mm. And I'm really afraid of not being heard. Yeah. Of not being listened to. Yes. And so I really need to be responsible adult about that and engage that conversation with him about yes you know really asking for presence so that i yes have peace of mind yes and i'm being heard yes and we can make a decision that really reflects the truth of and and, 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 and a collaboration that's right yeah And we're going to get into the concepts because eventually the concepts talk about the right of decision makes effective leadership possible, which I don't want to get into that. But the bottom line is part of what's sitting in my belly right now is 
it may be that because this is my area of passion, let's say, right. that it may be more appropriate for me to take the leadership role on that, which I can talk with him about. There you go. And, and that may be an elegant solution where I take the lead on it. We can still make the decision collectively. Right. So it's just a huge stretch um, in terms of really working as a group, you know, an intimate group to create a home that really looks after the common welfare of our whole family. Yeah. And, um, and I just wanted to say I have some discomfort about that because yeah. I'm really honest about it. Sure. Yeah, if you, and, really, um, if you really want to grow spiritually, be in relationship with another person. And buy a house with somebody. Or what? That's and move in together. So there you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so here I am feeling those growing pains. So yay, yay, yay for me. Yeah. And um, and we also talked a little bit about the the parallel between the first step and the first tradition and what I, what came up. You also made a comment that I'm, I'm going to extend that to the first concept. So yes, that's a, a an insight for a later time, but that's I want to know it now. They're all so lovely and related. Exactly. And they sound so lofty, but they're so practical as my exactly, that's exactly right. Go ahead. And I'm grateful that we're, I feel like I'm turning up the volume on the conversation of it of being more aligned in my life yeah. and acting more like an adult in terms of dialoguing with other people, which I'd rather not do because it seems very inefficient on some level, just oh. get out of my way. <laughs> and, you know, so I can make a decision, you right. know, right. but there I am alone doing that, which is one way to do it quite happily, but yeah. it's not the decision I've currently made. So, but the parallel that I see is We're either in the first step, I'm making, I'm, I come into Al-Anon because I've been aligning with what I'm going to call al alcoholism or addiction. Yeah. That has been my alignment. Mm -hmm. The, so, because the first tradition talks about unity. So there, there I am unifying with that. And the first tradition is inviting me to really ask myself, is that the choice you want to make? Is that really where you want to align? Or do you want to align with something else that feels healthier and more spacious and more light? So there for me is the decision. Yeah. And um, it's not that I automatically align with another person. It's I align with a principle or, and I can at least call it the principle of health and well-being, for yeah. example. Yeah. Cut the God part out just, exactly. just to keep it super clean. Super and, clean. And I can make a decision to align with health. Yeah. And um, and not compromise that because that in my belly is not something that I personally can compromise. And again, as somebody else said earlier, it's not about for me trying to there's the, there's the fine line. There's that God line, because it's not about me trying to say, Hey, everybody else, you need to line up this way. Cause this is what a straight line looks like. Right. It's like, no, cut the bullshit out of that. And just really get clear about you get to make an, a, a decision about yeah. what's important to you and align that way. And I know it's a little tricky when there's another person in the picture. So I'm going to have to keep a really open mind. And yeah. also practice listening at a much higher level yeah. and being willing to be in that dialogue so that I can keep in a partnership working towards co-creating something that is healthy and beautiful. Did you hear the words that you just used? I hope everybody heard the words that you used. I know just... that I heard them, so. Partnership. Yeah. Co-create. And that's a foreign language. <laughs> and, a, and a bit of a four-letter word for me, so. Yeah, I, 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 you know, there I am humbly admitting that. No, oh, yeah. Well, and but but here you are open talking about it, learning about it, challenged by it, uh, adjusting to it. Right. Squirming. And that's OK. Well, that means at least it's getting looser, <laughs> you know. Well, yeah. And and it a, a, a phrase that's come to me just in the last oh, probably six months or so. And that is, it says practice these principles in all our affairs. I said, you know what? We're really just practicing life. 
Right. We're just practicing life. And we always will be practicing life if we're awake, because what you're talking about is being conscious. What you're talking about is being awake. And when you're really awake, you're aware of other people. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I think you're touching on the part of me that when I don't feel heard, I feel I feel like when, when I'm not, when it's not reflected back to me, I understand it's really important to you that you're, that you, that you have a really solid peace of mind that your animals are safe. And I really hear you. Yeah. And, and I can see that when I don't have that, that's the part of me that gets super agitated Mm -hmm. and that wants to cut, make a decision, which means cut him out, (laughs) you know, and and I, and I need to practice an open mind and some prayer where I can really keep coming back and staying committed to the, I get to be heard. And I, and I can ask for that too, which hopefully will help be a, a flag or to presence him to say, I really want to have a conscious conversation about this because this really matters to me and it's really sitting poorly in my belly yeah. and it makes me want to walk away. I don't need to necessarily say that. Oh no, you do. Oh no, do. No, yeah. oh no, oh no, you do need to say. Okay, because that. that's a part of me that's like, no, you pack that shit up. <laughs> no, 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 you reveal. Okay. Not, not. You're not. Uh, how do you say? Mm, guilting I, him or I, shaming I, him or or manipulating him. You're I just feel so it. vulnerable; it almost feels threatening. <laughs> that's where you're. I think There's connected to the soul of another person. Say that again, please. You're Perfect. connecting to the soul of another person. You're allowing them to be with you and vulnerable to hearing it. And um, you're in a partnership with them, with this person. Yeah. No, I, 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 I'm not a relationship counselor. <laughs> well, I just want you to know you're responsible for part of this, Herb. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, blame me. <laughs> I, I'm teasing. I mean, I'm not teasing, and I am teasing. I right, mean, right. the work we did created the space for this. Nice. And right. um, and here we are growing through it. So thank well, you. Well, you growing through it. Yeah. Go. That's right. And, and I'm just uncomfortable, and it's okay. Um. Yeah. And talking in an environment like this allows you to explore that, to feel it, and then you'll be able to talk more effectively uh, in your quiet, intimate relationship. Thank you so much. Nice. Um, So tradition two, we're moving on. Thank you. Tradition two, short form, which is interesting that the short form is longer than the long form. Yeah, I know. Look at at the, uh, the worksheet. It's so, it was so funny. For our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God, as we may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Uh, So this is about the group conscience. This is about believing that the body, the body is animated by this life force. I mean, obvious relationship to step two. Uh, In the metaphor that I'm using, in terms of the unity, what brings unity to the body? My body is unified because of the life principle. When the life principle goes away, so do literally I. Although nothing looks any different, as a corpse, I don't look any different than I do right now, although I won't be moving and talking. All right, so there is some type of life force principle in me that makes it all the moving parts and brings them all in integration. Then that's what we're talking about here. Um, It's from my standpoint, it's very important that I have a home group, meaning a group that I'm committed to, as I think I mentioned in my opening comments. <clears throat> they get to know me week after week after week, year after year after year. And quite frankly, uh, I get to know them and I can be a 
a very integral part of the culture of the group. It's very important for rotation of leadership. Initially, the group, my home group, had a leader that was there for 10 years as the chairperson of the group. Once I got some information uh, and transformation from the step work and then some information from the traditions, I began to suggest that we have like a group conscience, like we have a, a leadership group. That, and now we, we rotate leadership once a year. It's very healthy for the group to have that rotation so that no one person becomes identified as the authority and or the leader of the group. It, it's just human nature. It's just human nature. There's no bad or good. There's just human nature. Uh, in one of the pieces of literature, it uh, indicates, might be the 12 and 12, that this elder statesman, in, in the best of senses, the, the connotation is the wisdom person in the group, has sure knowledge, quiet opinion, and humble example. Sure knowledge, they have some information. Quiet opinion, they can express it without challenging, without being right, without confrontational and humble example. And they behave, not necessarily how they speak, but how do they behave? There's a principle in the 12 and 12 in tradition too that I adopted as a life principle for me. And that is, it, it, it takes a minute to digest and unpack the good may be the enemy of the best. I had never seen it before. I'm, it was about seven years ago. I was reading it for some reason, and my life circumstances are all changed. And uh, it was a time for me to reevaluate many things. <clears throat> and um, and I, wow, okay, that I love the pithy wisdom kind of sayings, things that are filled with something to mine. And um, you've heard me speak many times about different things. The good may be the enemy of the best. And as I thought about it, oh, Herb, you're good at many things for whatever reason, talent, exposure, training. I'm good at many things. But you have a talent, one talent that's absolutely outstanding. To the extent that you're doing 12 good things, you're not focused on the best thing in you. And now as you get older, you have to be conscious of economy of energy and time. And so I made a list of all the activities that I have in my life, everything. And I ranked them, one being the best, the bullseye, and others being really good stuff, two, three, four, five, but relatively speaking, not all of them the best, but good stuff. I mean, there was nothing on there that was inappropriate or out of line with decency. I was contributing. But I said, to the extent I'm not doing number one, that I'm doing two, three, four, five, I'm not doing number one. So it took me three months, but I eliminated everything that wasn't a number one. Resigned from board, stopped activity, changed uh, behavior in some area. The freedom that I felt from that. And that's why I'm, I'm bringing that principle to you in, in a more um, unpacked way. It was, it, it might be a, a principle that you could help in your own life to prioritize. Each one of you is good at many things. But there's one or two things that are your special gifts, your special joy, your special passion, your special ability to contribute to the people around you. To the extent that you're dispersed, you're not focused. It, it's just a challenge that might be very profitable for you and the people around you. Now, for you perfectionists out there, the best may be the enemy of the good. <laughs> I'm just turning it inside out. 
because you all want to just be perfect and you drive yourself and everybody else, by the way, crazy uh, with your perfectionism. So there's a challenge there, but I won't even go much further with that. The, 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 the quote from page 14, I, I quoted 14 in the area of sacrifice at the bottom in the big book, but now at the top for uh, tradition too. I must turn in all things to the father of light who presides over us all. It's just a wonderful image. I must turn in all things to the father of light who presides over us all. So this is the essence of step two, that there is this life force in the body that will guide us if in fact we listen and we listen to one another. We sacrifice our personal agenda. We have a principle of humility. I'm one of many. I am one, but it's of many. And the checklist really, uh, the GSO checklist it has lots of wonderful questions, but the one uh, word that stood out to me was that partnership that we've already talked about. So if you have comments, questions, uh, experiences in the area of tradition too. Um, let's have a discussion about that. This, so first off, I just have to totally agree with other people who have shared. This has been provided an amazing breakthrough, unexpected and amazing, fabulous. The word unity, I've adopted it as my word for the year. And nice. Um, nice. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's affected me even more than alignment. It's somehow that harmonizing of internal. But they're complementary, aren't they? They are. They are. But there's something more um, like cherished versus respected. There's yeah. something that gets at my heart with the word unity. A hundred percent. Oh, that's a nice insight. No, that's right. No, respect appeals to my head. And yep. cherished, just, it, it's my soul. <laughs> yes, that's the, for me, alignment and, and, uh, nice. and unity. Well, nice. I like that. Very nice insight. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I, so a couple of things. I've been the district registrar for our district, and it's a pretty big district. And um, the uh, chairperson of the district kept talking about this very thing. We do not govern. We're trusted servants that we're always... Um, so I had to look it up and I'm a word nerd anyway. Uh, so servants are devoted and helpful and not to govern is direct or control. And um, it's so counterintuitive to me coming from a business environment and an adult trainer. Right. It's very counterintuitive. Like I'm the wise one here and you should just shut up and listen to me. Very wise. <laughs> um, so that was quite an adjustment and I have to say it was uh, a learning opportunity and it, it's uh, it, it's good I'm, I mean I'm here I love the person who brought up why are you here why am I here I am here to to grow in wisdom and knowledge for myself yeah. but also I want to know better than them about the traditions I want to be able to control you know Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> she just brought that up and I was like oh my gosh yes there's a part of me who wants to be able to throw it back at them mm. right Whew, that was a good uh, realization so <laughs> um and last but not least my challenge is I was in a business meeting today I'm the alternate treasurer for my home group and um I'm just curious if you have any advice or insights on how to get more people to show up oh um it's I, I this was also a breakthrough for me to i'm just getting used to consulting my own higher power and i'm trusting your higher power to take care of you there's codependent relief no. there yeah um so the idea of trusting that there's a group higher power group conscience higher power available that to trust in uh, but when only four people show up uh, at a business meeting, right. it's just challenging because it's a big group. It's a lot of people. And um, yeah, that's my well, question. Well, 
I'm, I'm going to parallel it. How do you get people to meditate? Really, seriously. Everybody would agree. Oh, meditation is really important. Oh, meditation is step 11. Oh, meditation, my sponsor really wants me. Oh, meditation, all spiritual people meditate. It's really critically important. Do you meditate? No, I don't have time. Well, because they don't, they mouth, but they don't have a value proposition. What's the value proposition? Bill in step 11 says the value proposition is as air, water, sunshine, and food nourish the body, prayer and meditation nourishes the soul. He tries to give us the value mm. proposition. So is it a value to the people this meeting. I mean, who wants to go to another meeting, especially a business meeting, especially a 12-step business meeting? Have you been in those meetings? The people are nuts and they're very opinionated, oh, by the way. And it's really dry and it's boring, by the way. Yes, so what's I know. The, yeah. So what's the value proposition? And oh, it sounded to me like it, it, it might have been on a different day and, and time and, and it's not convenient. So, you number one, you got to make it convenient. Number two, you got to make it a benefit of value. People have need to want to go because there's a value for them, either because of the group or personally. Look at who showed up today. Who shows up for a traditions workshop? Well, people who think it's a value, both for themselves or people like yourself. And Ashley, who want to throw it in other people's faces. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. but but you also have to be realistic. Now, I come from <laughs> I come, yeah, I come from corporate environment, and I I've heard teachers who come from a teacher's environment, and it's an operating principle. Twenty percent of people do eighty percent of the work, or twenty or eighty percent of the talking. And it's the same in my workshop. Ashley's been in my physical workshops, all right? It's the same 20% of people that participate, whether it's physical or whether it's a, a, a Zoom workshop. It's the same 20, I mean, they rotate, but there's about 20% that step up and participate. Now, whether that's a personality thing or whether that's well, whatever it is, it, it, it seems to be a very truism that no matter what the environment, 20% are present in the sense of active and 80% are not. So deal with reality at the same time, but it has to be convenient, and especially in today's environment where there's so much to do and many distractions, many things that call on us. So it needs to be convenient and there needs to be a clear uh, benefit to the individual, not to the group, a benefit to that individual. We, we do what we feel is a benefit to ourselves. Yet yeah, it's a, a general problem and it's not solved. It's not solvable, but it can be improved. Yeah. And one of the things that we're doing here is it, people get information, people who came to get a little information, probably get a little bit more than they want uh, or expected. And, and that will motivate some people. Oh, oh, I can see the benefit of this for me now that I understand it. So there's some training and knowledge. So that's a third component is making people aware of the Opportunity. The, opp the opportunity and the purpose and the implications for themselves. I think about uh, tradition two, uh, what came up came to mind for me was uh, a number of years ago, I attended a PRASA um, and went to an Al-Anon PRASA workshop. And um, it, was, it was on tradition two. And a member shared about um, the group conscience and the importance of the uh, the 
the person that abstains from the group conscience. And um, good. And I and I um, it really opened my mind a lot. And what what I've been able to do in meetings uh, since then is like when we do take a group conscience, if there's an abstention, it's like to you know be the devil's advocate or whatever and and ask you know hey you know could, would you would you like to share with us why you uh abstained even after there's been discussion heated discussion or whatever is to still, to <laughs> still be willing to do that you know right and um sometimes you know like at some some meetings beyond the group level that i've been in and and even gotten the chair it's like sometimes people don't want to you know, hear any more discussion because, uh, you know, they don't have the time they want to go home or whatever. And, um, but, you know, there's been a number of times over the years where I've seen where, you know, hey, keep an open mind, like maybe this, may, maybe this hearing this person's uh, point of view might, uh, might benefit the group. And, um, and I've even seen where, where we've set up, um, you know, thought forces or whatever on something after even after a group conscience has been been taken it's like the group has decided to hey why don't we do a thought force on this and look into the a little bit further what's the, word, what's the phrase you're using i've not heard it before thought force um well in al on recently a number of years ago they started putting together um and they're, they're using terms that i that are really corporate type terms but I like, I like the them. term. Could you say and it? They use thought, thought force is that's when you thought look force. into something, you look into th something, and then they actually have after that, after that thought force reports back to the group or whatever. And then, and then you actually have a, um, I forget, task, task a task force. force that actually implements. I, that. I see. Thought force, task force, kind of like a brainstorm yeah. session. Right, right. And, uh, and, and then sometimes you can have that intermingled where you have a thought right. force. No, no, it's no. I'm, I'm so glad we're having that conversation. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so I mean, I, you know, and then on a personal level, you know, I had jotted down in my 12 and 12 that, you know, a number of years ago when my mom, I was going through stuff with my mom and my brother and my brother had come into the situation and, and, um, and I really tradition to going to a tradition to study one Friday night helped me realize that, you know, Hey, I'm not an authority over what my mom and my brother do or whatever. And it's like, but, Oh my gosh, I read that that was 2010. And it took me a long time to really implement that, you know, <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> but I, I, yeah. anyway, I just, you know, thank you so much. Um, I, I, when Paul to, told me about the, the the flyer showed me the flyer. I was like, Paul, this is like monthly, you know, whatever. And it's like, he goes, yeah, but I, I wanted to go to, and I go, okay, I'll try it, you know, because you know we've been to a lot of tradition studies and stuff right. over the years. Right. And but but I love hearing um hearing the different insights, and I appreciate. It. Thank she, you. She I, reads fine print, Herb. Well, that, <laughs> that you that's a yin and yang. That's a great combination. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you for being here. That's great. Thank hey, Herb, one thing too, if I could quickly chime in on the uh, second tradition and taking it to the second step again, <laughs> this just resonates to me right now. I've learned that the second step is sanity and insanity, healthy and unhealthy. And there's a discernment in there in the second step in my group, if I'm going to behave in a healthy way as an elder statesman or in an unhealthy despotic way or yeah. in sort of a passive right. way. And so anytime something comes up, that's the opportunity for me. It's like, I have a choice. How am I going to respond to this? And you've helped me. Like I had to let someone go in a corporate environment and there are consequences. I can't control people, but there are consequences right. for passions. Right. But I don't have to be the necessarily the enforcer so well but you are the enforcer in the sense of reality that there are consequences these are the consequences goodbye yeah i'm the one who had to do it but there yeah. was principles with that so i didn't exactly, exactly. i wasn't conflicted
Right. Yeah. One. Well, but see, and underneath what you just said is, uh, uh, again, I'm going to emphasize it, consciousness. You don't have a choice if you don't know you have a choice. Yeah. You don't have it. Yeah. You don't know that you can turn left. You can't turn left. Yeah. So we yeah. need information in order to make choices. That's, I mean, it's kind of, it's so obvious once you see it, but I didn't see it for a long time. <laughs> And I wanted to just share how I've seen um, tradition two in action and the beauty of a loving authority when it actually does, it's when he, she, it, whatever you want to call it, expresses itself through the group. Yeah, right. And I remember one time early on uh, in my recovery, um, I was in a meeting and a person shared and, um, you know, what they shared, they shared where they were. And uh, the person, someone shared behind them. And I mean, they ripped that person to shreds. Really, they shared behind them, ripped them to shreds. Mm -hmm. And the entire, the rest of the meeting, the whole group just shared the opposite of what that person who ripped them to shreds did. Mm -hmm. I mean, they built that person back up and I could really see the love of the group. Everyone instinctively knew the damage that they were causing and their whole, the rest of the meeting was entirely devoted to- That's a very uh, healthy meeting. Up. You That's know, a very just, healthy it was, meeting. It was, beautiful. Yeah. it was beautiful, you know, and you could just see God expressing himself through the group conscious. There was no right. discussion about it. It sure. just happened organically, you know, and then another thing that um, I've experienced because the group conscience for me happens actually in the group where I just explain where it's the conscious of the group and they just take action and they do it. And then we have the group consciences meetings that we actually hold and in group conscience meetings where it really can be contentious. One of the things that um, I've experienced, well, two things. We had this one treasurer, the first treasurer, he was a person, he had his own business, okay? And as a business owner, you know, he was very conscious of finances and very conscious of keeping a prudent reserve with his business and operating expenses and all this other kind of stuff. And he was our treasurer and he was insistent upon us having more money in the treasurer than what we needed of based course. on his experience as a businessman. Of course. Now, and it was like, we, the group, we didn't want to do that because we did not want to have money for no unstated purpose, right. okay, in our treasure. Because to me, that's just a, a combination. You know, it just gives someone a reason to want to be the treasurer so they can do what they want to do with the money, you know? And the group, talk, talk, talk. He ended up stepping down from the position you know, decided that maybe someone else could do the position better. You yeah, know, yeah. He, he backed out as gracefully as he could. Yeah. The treasurer we got after that was a person who uh, was a financial professional, you know, and the same thing, you know, he was a financial uh, professional. He knew his business. He had initials behind his name, you know, all this other kind of stuff. And his whole thing, again, was we needed to keep X amount of dollars in our prudent reserve. And we just, the group just didn't think that that was necessary to have thousands of dollars that we didn't need that was beyond our monthly expenses. And that person too ended up bowing out gracefully. But go. it was after conversations, you know, talk, and he never really did um, come to where we were, mm -hmm. but he did not stop coming to the meetings. You know, occasionally at group conscience, he would bring it up. Well, you know, you all really didn't agree with my suggestion, but, you know, I mean, he let it go gradually, but it was always still there. But yep. at the same time, the group was able to move on. Well, it sounds like a very healthy group. It sounds like a very healthy group mm -hmm. and quite frankly, very healthy people that are listening to the group reluctantly and reluctantly resigning and reluctantly accepting. But it sounds overall like a very healthy group. We try to be. We've been, um, I'm in Washington. Well, the group is in Washington, D.C. and it's been in existence since 1956. Yeah. You know, and... Um, it's been my home group for the entire time that I've been in um, recovery, and it is a step in traditions meeting. Yeah. But, you know, the traditions, even though I went, I've been going to that meeting, you know, it's just been recently that I've really tried to embrace the traditions. Yeah. Because you know, I was going to the step meetings, and I would just, you know, hear the traditions. Right, right. I wasn't really absorbing them. 
like they, I could have been a practice. They become enough. they become very interesting when you uh-huh. know more about them. Right. That, right. And that's the, why I'm at the workshop. <laughs> yeah, and wonderful, wonderful. And one of the comments I want to make in light of your comments is that the group conscience is not a vote of the majority on a one-time deal. The group conscience is a process over a long, potentially long period of many meetings and much time and much conversation. And as you said, much heated debate, maybe, <laughs> uh, where, where then sort of a consensus is taken. So uh, please, if you don't know much about group conscience, get some literature and read about it, because it's, it's not just voting. It's being aware of, it's being uh, very respectful and listening both to the majority position and the minority position and, and coming at some point to conclusion, it doesn't go on forever, although sometimes it might seem like that. <laughs> and a couple of these have just been touched on in the comments is it's an informed group conscience. Um, yeah. We need, um, it's not just a knee jerk vote. And I had this come up with my home group early on in the pandemic where we were making quick decisions or we were the group was making quick decisions based on almost nothing, you know, just kind of like, Oh, how do I feel about this? No question. Quick quick talk. And then, yeah, let's vote right now. And, and, and as has been mentioned and also is, is, is this, this is our higher power. The are coming through the group conscience. Um, Bill talks about prayerful consideration for bigger things you know, maybe not about a coffee pot, but, you know, if it's a big deal, then we get together, we talk about it, and then often we put it off for a while. We're not in a hurry. And the other, so so we, we need information, we need facts, we need to discuss, we need to hear points of view and make an informed group conscience. And people have a tendency to think, you know, that they just kind of vote on something very quick if they're, if it's not a healthy group. Thanks. I actually have a question, but before I ask you the question, I wanted to say the end thing that came with my thinking about the traditions is it gave me a new purpose for service. It's the newcomer. Every time I'm abiding by the traditions, it's for that the newcomer. Um, but so the issue that's come up is someone brought up a group conscience in our group about another group that doesn't have funds for something. And I noticed the word each for each group. And I was just curious if you had any thoughts on group consciences brought up about another group. Oh, I'm not sure what the question is. Um, well, we have a, a Zoom account. Yeah. And the issue that happened is a number of groups that happened to meet at the same time and same, same place, but are different groups. I see. So we were sharing a, a Zoom account and now we, I found out we can't. It's actually each, per, each group has to have, um, you can't share the Zoom account unless, you can't share the password. You have to actually, each person has to have a 500 plus person exemption. And there's this whole subsec section of- oh, Okay, you're getting too much in the weeds. What's, so that's the whole thing, is like, once you get complicated, aren't the traditions starting to be- Violet, it, it, can you have multiple group consciences about like another group and another group's finances? So someone wants another group. Each that group is independent. In a, I, I, yeah. I don't know the exact answer to the question. I'm hearing the question. And that is, uh, can another group support a, a, a separate group? Yes. Financial standpoint. Um, my instinct is, no, that would be inappropriate. Uh, I think each group has to be independently uh, supportive uh, of themselves. Uh, If they can't support themselves, like a meeting. If a meeting can't support itself, it goes away. That's that's what I thought. Um, So Tradition 7 talks about every group group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. And, and I just feel like, you know, my sense about interpreting that tradition, which we're going to get to, is 
trust the process. If there are groups that don't make it, it's because they don't make it and it's okay. There, and that I, there's a healthy way for them to fall, fall away so that the flourishing groups can continue to serve the, the right. well-being of yeah. the, the whole fellowship and support our common welfare. So yeah. tradition yeah. seven. Well, and, and again, if the meeting is shriveling, it means it's not serving a purpose. Right. And, and I'm, I really adopted just recently this whole attitude. There are seasons and there are cycles. Right. Groups and have, it's okay. <laughs> and, it, and it's, it's okay. okay. Well, well what, what you said, I want to really emphasize that as an operating principle, and that is trust the process. Right. Yeah. Yeah, trust the soul, uh, the spirit, the anima uh, that uh, is underneath the steps, God as we don't understand it, that is underneath the traditions, God reliance rather than self-reliance. Trust that whatever the power is, and we'll neutralize the God and spiritual talk, whatever the power is, trust the power, trust the force. <laughs> Right. Yeah. We're going to move on now to the uh, third tradition. Short form. The only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. I don't have the traditions for other fellowships, so I don't know what those are. I'm sure they're, they're different, but pretty much aligned. The only requirement for AA membership is a desire of the individual to stop drinking. And um, <clears throat> that, that's a, that uh, again, is a principle that was learned over several years. In the early days, they actually had membership requirements. And they, I, I have a copy of a form that was part of the membership sort of registration. You had to fill it out and be approved by the group to come in. It was kind of funny. And, and you all know about, I believe, Rule 62, where they gathered all the rules of the various clubs and they put them all down and they had 61. And so they, they got really uh, a nice sense of humor. And they said, and Rule 62 is they didn't have a 62, but they made one, is let's not take ourselves too seriously. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> any comments on uh, a Tradition Tree? Um, the whole principle here is to be inclusive. And Bill says it in the big book, never exclusive. There are no rules, there are no regulations, there are no membership requirements, there are no leaders, there are no experts totally inclusive 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 never exclusive it's because we we want to not have any barriers or obstacles to help people that's why the whole con conversation around god got modified as you understand it and later on even the alternate use of the term higher power so that people were not there was no barrier coming because people would perceive it as a religion and have any negative uh, resistance to it from uh, the point of view of some type of a religious tradition. Um, and the other thing is no, no affiliation. No affiliation with any other group, including the room that you're meeting in. It's not the St. Aloysius AA meeting, if you're meeting in St. Aloysius Church, all right? Because that implies affiliation. It, it, it sounds kind of subtle and silly, but people who would see that and not understand might be put off because of the implied association, even though it wasn't intended association. Again, uh, keeping in mind from step 10, love and tolerance is our code. Step 10, after you finish step nine, Bill says we enter the world of the spirit. This is what we're doing. We're entering to the soul, the life force, the anima, that which animates us. Be careful of clicks. It's human nature. 
we form friendships and it's easy to walk into a meeting and join our friends and and yet there's people there for their first time, maybe one or two people, and they're awkward, they're embarrassed, they don't know what to do, they don't know how it works. You can spot them, really, if you look around the room and you're conscious, and it might just be you extend your hand and say, I'm her, welcome. That's it. You don't have to proselytize, and you certainly don't have to become friends with them. But the, the, the huge word I have on my notes is welcome the spirit of welcome when i walk into a meeting i want to have that as my lenses through which i look all are welcome and how can i express that sometimes of course it is meeting with your friends that's just fine There's questions concerning men's stag and women's stag and doctor meetings and lawyer meetings and pilot meetings and priest meetings. And those are all questions that can be handled. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty supportive of specialty meetings, but not as a, a single source of your uh, meeting exposure. Um, <clears throat> I did some work for a recovery place for Catholic priests. So, where they got sober, they were they, they were there. I mean, you know, the normal the normal uh, <clears throat> recovery for uh, insurance and, and institutional recovery is thirty to sixty days. Uh, the normal requirement for doctors is ninety days. The normal requirement for attorneys is ninety days. The normal requirement for pilots is 120 days. For Catholic priests, the normal requirement is nine months. They're hard, hard, or ministers of any kind because they think they are spiritual and they have some, so it's really hard for them to acknowledge with the humility. Um, <clears throat> so it's really important that we adapt and adopt uh, different mm, ways for uh, people to find the message and uh, and keep in mind singleness of purpose. That's that's really the key here. Um, I don't get into the controversy about the uh, add-ons. I'm an alcoholic and an addict. I'm an alcoholic and a codependent. I'm an alcoholic and I'm in Al-Anon. Yes, I have opinions about that. I don't think it's necessary. Or even, even this, I'm a grateful alcoholic. Well, okay, I understand that. But all I say is I'm Herb, I'm an alcoholic. I keep it really simple and I don't make myself special. We have the same thing with anonymity. And we'll talk about that when we get to 11 and 12, where people add something onto get i mean they do it probably well intentioned i'm a recovered alcoholic i understand that i really understand actually the connotation of the word but why are you being different in a meeting all right why are you being different it's okay to be have your unique personalities but again once uh, that humility is one of many I'm just another grain of sand on the beach. I'm important, but I'm not the center of the beach. So I've got lots of hands on this one. I love that history of, uh, of AA. And just for anyone who's interested, there's some really good books. AA Comes of Age, uh, Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers and Pass It On. And all of those are a deep dive into the history. but. Tradition three really touched me because back then there was actually a person that they were entertained that wanted to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. He was a black, he was a dope fiend, he was a transvestite, and worst of all, he was a jazz musician. Orders, <laughs> right? But uh, the question was, what do we do with this guy? And they let him in, and what I think is beautiful, he became one of the most prolific uh, 12 steppers in the fellowship. And even Bill Wilson, or Dr. Bob, excuse me, was nervous about even, even like letting women in the group. 
And sure. uh, so the the notion is like to you know in the literature it says somewhere I was looking for it it doesn't say it in there I thought we should be inclusive never exclusive and I've been in meetings where in fact my one of my first AA meetings there was literally a brawl in the meeting over an addict sharing and uh, so sure. people get really high strung about it but to me it's like good luck finding a pure alcoholic yeah. these days yeah. and so it's important to facilitate. Right that 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 inclusivity for people who don't know i mean when i was new i identified as an alcoholic okay that makes sense you know so i get it but today it's like god <laughs> i've got it all right it's like i identify as an alcoholic and probably a few other things well and mm -hmm. so this all of this helps me to to heal myself so yeah well and that's where the concept of singleness of purpose comes in i yeah. my work is not for alcoholics yeah. exclusively my right. work is for anybody who wants a spiritual awakening so yes. it's broader than alcoholics anonymous it's broader than including al-anon it's broader than including uh, drug addicts it's anybody whether you have an addiction or not but i'm not connected to any fellowship i'm just right. connected to the methodology of the 12-step process yeah. yeah thank you yeah. you know I, yeah, sir, bill too he envisioned that these that these principles would transform the world yeah that that, that was part of he 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 envisioned a, a time where that would happen we were talking about that a while ago yeah yeah earlier could i interject yes you're not interjecting you're oh, okay can i share too <laughs> um okay you, have you to mentioned step in front of paul now, yeah, right. You mentioned Al Anon's tradition, and what, what it says is the relatives of alcoholics, when gathered together for mutual aid, may call themselves an Al Anon family group, provided that as a group they have no other affiliation. The only requirement for membership is that there be a problem of alcoholism in a relative or friend. And actually, last night I had a, a newcomer who came to my Thursday night meeting um, text me, and she um, she asked me, you know, first she asked me how much time in the program, which kind of always kind of gets me because, you know, the group I came from, that was so, yeah. you know, whatever. But um, but then uh, she asked me about, um, you know, her, the person that she was coming because of was an addict and, and, you know, would she still be, you know, is this really for her? And, mm -hmm. you know, I was really careful because, you know, one of the things that I told her was, you know, um, I came because of a boyfriend, but his drinking bothered me, but he was also a cocaine addict, you know, and then I, I grew up with a, a heroin addict who, you know, and, and Al-Anon helped me with both of those relationships. And, and like, like Paul talked about, you know, there's no, uh, there's probably very few, I don't know. Um, there's a lot, a lot of alcoholics out there that, that use, that use different substances and that, but but I also, you know, I also didn't want to dilute the program also, like because Al-Anon, like AA talks about not diluting the program. And, and so I found a little piece of literature that had, you know, that addressed that. And I, I sent, you know, I, I took a picture of it and sent it to her. But I said, you know, mainly it's for, for you to make the decision, yeah. not Discerning. someone else. Yeah. And to and to me, and she, meant, she mentioned uh, Naranon. I said, you know, Try those meetings too. Try yeah. Alan, try everything, you know, it's like and see what works for you. Yeah. And I know a lot of people who come in, they think that's their only pro the addict's only problem, but then they find out after a while that, oh no, it's just that because that that addiction was like had some kind of uh, you know, made them look tougher or something and they come to find out they they drank a lot too, you know. But right, right. Uh, anyway, I you know, I and then I also told her, I, I said, you know. I hope I didn't, oh, I didn't share too much, you know, over, you know, confuse you or whatever. And, and I don't like texting so much, but some people like to do that. And I, you know, I hope she reaches out at some point and I hope she shows up next week. But oh. um, I think the thing is like, like was said is to be inclusive, you know, to be inclusive and helpful. See what you wanted to do was to be helpful, but also to be clear. And that was, that's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had, uh, uh, I spent 25 or 30 years in a Minstag step 
accountability uh, meeting. And uh, it was uh, very powerful for me uh, in terms of working the steps. It was a men's day, all right? And one night we had a woman come in there and she was just shaking and just, you could just see an absolute newcomer. And she didn't know, she just saw the AA meeting and she just walked in. We, we took an immediate group conscience and we changed it that night so that she could stay and she could hear and she could, she could share. That's, That's cool. Right that time. actually <laughs> happened to me yeah. when I went to, I was doing 90 meetings in 90 days for an Al-Anon. Yeah. And I went to a meeting in Las Vegas yeah. and my dad dropped me off and took off. I, I still had, a, I think I still had a foot in the car <laughs> and I went in there and the al meeting was closed. It mm. had been closed for some time mm. and the alcoholics welcomed me and they took a group conscience at the end that I could share. Yeah. See, I'm so glad that you, uh, you have a similar example because it reinforces, I hope you're hearing it people. Now, careful. <laughs> yeah, right, because we could take over. <laughs> careful. No, no, no. I'm not taking, I'm not talking about taking over. I'm talking about be careful that you may not have a group that would be so flexible. All right. Yeah. Now, so in my men's stag that my home group, all right, they would not do that. Yeah. They they have a designated person. If somebody shows up that's not an alcoholic, male or not, and or if it's an alcoholic woman. They're, they're not welcome. We yeah, have a designated know. person that would walk them outside and spend the balance of the time personally with them in the parking lot, but they're not, they're not invited to the meeting because the meeting is a closed men's stag meeting. I mean, that's right. But right. they're very right. clear. They've thought it through. Yeah. They have designated people to help, so they've thought it through. So I'm just saying, just be careful that uh, what we just expressed in terms of the flexibility of our experiences may not be yours. <laughs> right. And this was way before cell phones. And, uh, oh, you know, yeah. mm. and it was like two days before Christmas. So people were really, you know, <laughs> a, a little more generous mood. <laughs> yeah, two, two, two alcoholics even invited this alcoholic couple invited me to another meeting, offered to pick me up. Well, and my dad, my dad was like, no, no, I'll drop you off. You know, it's like my dad was so suspicious. Right, <laughs> right, right. Thank you. Anyway, I, I wanted to share um, how Tradition 3 has, has saved me. Um, when I first, my very, very first uh, meeting that I attended, um, I, I, I'd just come off a week long binge and I hadn't gone to work and I woke up and recognized that I had to do something to save my butt. Like I, 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 I couldn't quite at that time, I wasn't sure whether there, I had a problem. I, I acknowledged that I had a problem, but more than anything, I was just wanting to get people off my back. So I headed to a meeting and uh, I walked into this meeting. There was one gentleman there. Um, he was carrying a, it must've been a birthday meeting anyway. So I followed him in with all the goodies and I'm, you know, like, that's always what I'd heard. Like, you know, we smoke and we, you know, eat cake and drink coffee. Like that's what you do at an AA meeting, right. just jokingly tongue in cheek. Um, anyway, uh, this gentleman started sharing his story with me and I thought, you know, this is weird. Like you're just telling me a whole bunch of stuff that like too personal, dude. <laughs> um, I started recognizing the room started to fill up and it was all men and also men of a specific ethnicity <laughs> everybody was everybody was Spanish okay. so I I when I recognized this it was like oh my gosh like I'm clearly an intruder here I'm in the wrong room now they didn't they didn't I'm, that I'm aware of, they didn't take any group conscience, but maybe they did beforehand or whatever, but they didn't let me leave because I tried to leave. And they're like, no, no, no. Um, and you're, you're exactly where you need to be. And, and so I stayed. Um, the meeting was in Spanish. Um, it was a podium meeting. And uh, there was actually two men that actually got up and shared in English for my benefit mm. uh, specifically, but most of it was in Spanish. And, and, and the thing is, like, God was there that night because I got the message loud and clear. 
Wow. Even though I couldn't understand a lick of what they were saying, I got it. Wow. And, and, and at the end of the meeting, they all teased me and welcomed me to come back anytime, made sure I stayed for cake because <laughs> it was, I don't know, I think it was some sort of birthday meeting too. And uh, they made sure I had a meeting list so that I could connect with people that I could understand the language. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I owe my life to those men um, because I don't, if they would have turned me away, I might not have ever got the message. That's right. And that, you know, now like, that's the point. Would you say that again for people? Because I want to highlight that. That's really the point. Go ahead, please. If if they had turned me away, I may never have gotten the message. Yeah. So even though it's a special interest group, they made sure that the primary purpose was looked after. Yeah. Right. Right. No. You know? That's that's just such a great story uh, to mm -hmm. emphasize this. Uh, the 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 spirit of welcome mm -hmm. and and they and and that you actually intuited even though you didn't understand the language you intuited the spirit of what was going on like and i i i can like it was absolutely my higher power speaking through those men yeah. Like it was like straight to my heart. Like, and I knew it was just like, I could feel my ears coming down from around my shoulders mm. or my shoulders coming down from around my ears. Right. Uh, I felt like a weight had been lifted and it was like, I just knew that I was in the right spot mm. and that I just had to keep coming back. And I seriously, that was in 2012 and I haven't left. <laughs> 10 years. Wonderful. And, and, and when you said that, you, you felt the spirit, you see, that's that life force underneath mm -hmm. the it was, fellowship that's supporting it. Yeah, it, it was definitely a Bill Wilson moment. Yeah. If you want to talk about that mountaintop experience, that was it. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. The thought that came to me to share about tradition three, about the singleness of purpose, um, I was at a meeting a few weeks ago, I don't remember what kind of meeting it was, <laughs> um, but they had a, a speaker who was talking specifically about um, working multiple programs in, in different programs. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what the conclusion of it was, but part of what I got out of it about the bit about when you're in a meeting that's for this program or for that program, even if you qualify for multiple, focusing on topic of the one that you're in um, is about the identification, mm -hmm. the recognition of the common experience. Because mm -hmm. um, like, and what you're doing, we're, it's this broader thing right. for the spiritual awakening and that, that um, the unmanageability that underlies all the different right. various issues that get, you know, that, that the unmanageability that gets expressed in a variety of different ways, depending on a person's particular physical makeup, their particular whatever. Right. Um, and so like in my experiences in Al-Anon, I've learned that it's beneficial to attend open AA meetings mm -hmm. because it gives me some, some perspective and understanding hearing from mm -hmm. AAs themselves like that. Mm -hmm. It opens the door for me to be able to have more understanding and compassion Good for, you. for for those folks experience no great mm -hmm. um and then like the thing about identification by by being by folk by the singleness of purpose of focusing um i'm probably not the only person who's had the experience where sometimes i'm sitting in a meeting and somebody else that i've never met before is telling their story and it sounds like they're telling my story and yeah. so it's that identification, just like in, in some of the opening stories in the big book, the purpose of those stories is for us to be able to recognize ourselves. And so we might recognize ourselves in this issue and we might recognize ourselves in that issue. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. there's, you know, there, there's some benefit in the, the visiting other groups, but I guess that's the point of the um, thing choosing the focus of the moment, I guess, and sticking sure. with that until you need to deal with the other one. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I've heard it many times from the uh, people in a variety of fellowships, especially Eleanor, uh, that to go to the open AA meetings gives them a sense of compassion at the very least, where there's a, uh, an, an ability then to be a little bit more tolerant as we understand the addiction and the pain uh, of the individual, not just the pain that they cause to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Gosh, this is just opening up so much for me, this um, study of the traditions. It is um, setting aside a lot of what I <laughs> uh, have experienced as well. Um, I thought I'd come to this because uh, to this workshop because I was asked to uh, speak on tradition three and share my experience on tradition three. And it was basically um, some negative experiences that I've had, I think, of why I was asked. And I have experienced in regards to uh, tradition three, where I've been, um, I wouldn't say exclus excluded, but where I was kind of separated from the whole, like it's mainly for, and, and I've been told this quite a few times, it's mainly for those um, from the overweight part. And so I come from the opposite. <laughs> In the eating and, disorder programs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You got it, got it, got it. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I know people have been asked to um, go to another group because this is for a specific. So how, how does one yeah. handle and kind of, you know, whether it be at a business meeting or like, what are some suggestions that you have um, in regards to this? I know that um, sometimes I feel like I have to try to um, force myself to belong or somehow um, say I do belong and I claim my seat and, you know, well, I think you have, I mean, first of all, I don't know all the circumstances that you're talking about, but just on the hearing what you're saying and knowing a little bit about the eating disorder variety of fellowships, um, there may be eight to 10 different eating disorder fellowships, whether it's overeating, undereating, uh, and a variety of in betweens. Um, and each of these separate programs. I mean, they're separate. They have their own literature. They have their own charters. They have their own uh, guidelines and um, their own definitions of abstinence. Um, it's probably you need to listen to the format of the meeting to see what the protocols are, because the meeting is set up by a group of people who set up the protocols. And for you, if you if you don't fit in there, you don't fit in there. Yeah. Go to go to a place where you fit, and the meeting format will let you know that. If in fact this is a meeting place for people who are overweight, that's their purpose, and you're not overweight, you don't belong there. You might have an eating disorder, and they're talking about an eating disorder, but that's not their focus. So find a place that has a, 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 a format and a protocol that fits within whatever it is you're looking to deal with. That would be my initial recommendation. Um, yeah, yeah. If you're a if you're a cocaine addict and you're not an alcoholic, you don't belong in Alcoholics Anonymous. You have a addiction to a drug. Alcohol is a drug. Cocaine is a drug. If you're a cocaine addict and you don't have an alcohol problem, you don't belong in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. That's the sense of primary purpose. All right. As Lisa was talking about in terms of that sense of identification, that's the real purpose there. Now, I've never yet met a drug addict that isn't an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I mean, but they don't know that at the beginning. <laughs> so uh, now I will temper what I just said, which was pretty black and white, by saying, uh, 
especially today with the young people. I mean, they're duly addicted, usually uh, drugs and alcohol. And typically there's some mental illness involved. So it's like really gets a lot of mix. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't ever want to be black and white. I always want to be helpful, but I was attempting to address your specific question. I think it's your specific question. Mm -hmm. I know it's definitely like our fellowship kind of encompasses all, all like anorexia, bulimia, and overweight, obesity. When you say um, your fellowship, which one is that? Uh, the food addicts one. The FA, all right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it does um, encompass all those, all those eating disorders. All right. But when it comes to my experience of where I've come from, sometimes I, I have experienced um, where there even has been times where I wanted to walk out of the meeting because I felt, excluded um but yet i know like i said i know is it, is it is it your perception problem or is it literally a problem of the group um i think it's individual um uh, because um sometimes a specific individual will comment uh specifically oh so you're being that. offended by an individual i'm being offended by not feeling included so yeah it's my own perception but if it's but if it's your feeling it's your problem right okay so so when it comes there has been as well there's a powerpoint that's out and the powerpoint is not included i don't the, understand what you're saying powerpoint what you um, it's not like it's for, um, I lose my words, um, it's, it's to be to present it to professionals, etc. a PowerPoint that, uh, let's say, to medical people or, you know, there's a PowerPoint. All right. And so in that, um, in that PowerPoint, it hasn't included. It doesn't uh, include what? I'm sorry. I'm the, the person with anorexia. It didn't include um, those you know, that population or whatever right. you want to did call you bring, it. Did you bring that point to the people that prepared the PowerPoint? Yeah, I have. I, I and did. what was their response? Um, well, we're basically, uh, we are basically for people who are overweight. Oh, well, there you go. That's yeah, what. and I think, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's kind of why I was asked to speak at the Tradition 3 Mm -hmm. um like at, at the meeting so i'm having some hope like there's little i've been in recovery for 20 years in this fellowship oh, right and right. so there's that little flicker of hope it's like i do okay. belong <laughs> well can you bring that to the group conscience Are you the group conscience of this individual meeting or the group conscience when it comes to the wsi or who, what do you who created mean? the powerpoint yeah, I, I am going to address it at, at this uh, traditions meeting. I am going to address that. So, yeah. 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 Good, so. luck. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed that uh, I sense that possibly a tradition isn't being, being abided by, but if I mention it, I'm going to somehow be excommunicated. You know, guys, take it into prayer, talk to your sponsor about it, and then figure out whether it's worthwhile or not. It's not about being perfect. It's about if it's substantial, then you might have the courage to do something about it. If it's not substantial, if it's like, who cares? Let it go. Um, yes, I wanted just to leave, but it's still, I've got sweaty palms, so I know that I have a, we've talked about it a, a little bit here, but mine is, um, I was, I'm in AA for 30, coming up on 35 years this month, and then I've been in Al-Anon for, for uh, 12 years, and there's, there's a significant problem in my Al-Anon meeting, where it's such a great meeting, and there's a lot of double winners in there, but it's an Al-Anon meeting. So we've got some people in there, there's two or three or four that really, it just riles their feathers when somebody in Al-Anon, um, when they're in Al-Anon and they want to say, you know, I'm also in the beverage program. I'm also, um, then they tell a little bit of their story about their drinking. 
And so they want me to go up and talk to that person because, you know, um, I've been in the salon for a while and it's like my responsibility. And we even have it in the format. Um, we do not talk about affiliations. We do not talk about outside issues. But of course, even though we say it, it's, um, it still happens. And my stomach just goes Rawr! when somebody new is talking about their alcoholism because I know other people are going to be very affected by it. And they are. And also because when I was in my very first Al-Anon meeting, I thought you had to know who I was. So I told you all about my alcoholism because that was a big part of my life. Thank God she did not embarrass me in the middle of the meeting, but afterwards walked me out and said, we talk about Al-Anon. It's a separate issue. And I said, okay, well, F you, I'm never coming back here again. Um, but it was the best thing that happened to me because I can separate my AA from my alcoholism. Right. Of course, it's confusing when they talk about the letter from the alcoholic and I am the alcoholic they're talking about. It goes back and forth. But I just don't know about this. I love this meeting on Thursday, but there's still so much controversy about the alcoholic sharing in an Al-Anon meeting. Not so much in the AA meetings sharing about Al-Anon. So just another input on that, please. Well, does the is the format clear enough? Uh, we keep putting in different... We just put it in the place because it's a 10 minute speaker and we put it in the format, but we've decided to just put it at the very last. So the very last thing before it's open for sharing is this is an al -Anon. Yes. So that's, so that's just been moved there um, as of next week, but you know, we don't all, people don't always hear that. Right? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So are, are we supposed to interrupt people? I don't oh, want to no, do that. No. We, we don't. Well, here's what I learned in corporate. We never criticize in public. We always praise in public. So you don't embarrass the individual. No, you had the experience. Model, yeah. model that. Somebody did not interrupt you. But afterwards, they let you know what the spirit of the meeting was. Now, you had the typical reaction of an alcoholic. <laughs> right? But you came back. I did. Yeah. And I love the meeting and I, and I like that. And they're all concerned about the newcomer coming in and they're going, what are these people talking about alcoholism? The alcoholic has destroyed my life. I don't want to hear about alcoholism. Yeah. That's the reason I'm here. So that's these people keep coming back to that part. And there's a lot of double winners in this meeting and they're relatively new and they keep speaking up. And I guess I just keep going and talking to them, but and sometimes they don't show back up, but I feel like, I guess that's my responsibility. I can relate. Well, as the it, it is your responsibility if you want it, but it's not your responsibility because somebody asked you to do it. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right. Let's yeah. Um, be very clear that, you know, you could share the burden with other people in the room and they don't have to be alcoholic in, uh, or a double winner in order to go up to the individual and share what the format and the spirit of the meeting is. So okay. I wouldn't take it on as, a, as you're, the, you're the white knight of the group. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. In our, one of our Al-Anon books on the 12 steps and 12 traditions, um, they have this lovely um, little section. It says the traditions are not rules. And I have been in meetings where people use them as hammers. So somebody else talked about that earlier. And I've certainly experienced that and made some of that mistake myself. Um, but then they talk about um, accepting the guidance of the traditions has been described as obedience to the unenforceable. And I love the gentleness of that and the spirit behind it, because I have certainly, you know, been a part of lots of um, meet Al-Anon meetings where there are a lot of double winners and thank goodness for that. And it does, you know, certainly there are lots of people with as cleverly as we have attempted to write and inform them and remind them uh, for some reason, they still you know, lots of them still talk about their other fellowships. Yeah, people don't listen. People don't listen. And, and um, as was written about in the comments, you know, and there's a level of generosity and, and grace that um, healthy meetings, I think, offer each other. And so 
there's been that. And then I've also seen it dealt with on a principal level. So kind of like somebody mentioned, you know, they were, they were in a meeting and somebody was a dis speaking disparagingly about another member. And then naturally and organically, other members <laughs> naturally spoke about the about their their other experience right. and so i've had it i've experienced it where um people have spoken about it in the meeting without naming the other person but just speaking very generally about the principle principle of singleness of purpose and and how they appreciate that right where it's called and, out and gently and yeah. again those and sharing your experience not your opinion that's right and it's not finger pointy. It's not soapboxy and hard to do. Hard to do. Hard to do well. And you know, those who hear it hear it, and those who don't don't. Anyway. Well, and it's about what your intention is and what's in your heart, because it will come out wonderfully if it's in your heart and in your intention. Usually. Right. It, as long as it's not the yeah a, a funky motive in there. There. And I think there's also you know somebody else spoke about it. You know, in the spirit of tradition one. Um, we have a personal responsibility and a common, uh, you know, to protect the common welfare and the, and the thing that we're all moving towards. And that means that there are members who are inspired to, it doesn't have to be a self-appointed one, but who are in, inspired to talk to people after the meetings. And, right. and sometimes they still show up and sometimes they don't. So we're I think you got to let go of the results of that too and trust them. Trust That's them. the point. Let go of the results. And, um, if you have any doubt about your motives, you probably want to wait and have a conversation with your sponsor. Exactly. And, and you know, and let, let go of the results and trust the process. So words to live by words to live by you guys have been great. What a, what a wonderful time together. I look forward to next month. Uh, just remember uh, next month we'll be looking at Traditions 4, 5, and 6. The assignments are on my website if you don't have it. I'm sure Rainy is already to press the trigger to send them to you anyway. And uh, read the 12 and 12 at a minimum and the uh, Traditions illustration. Those will be sufficient for a discussion like this based on that and your own experience. Um, please do the worksheets. And I don't mean just look at them. Do the writing on the worksheets you, uh, uh, based on the direction from the assignments. You will find it transformative. It will give you a sense of connection, and then it will give you a sense of uh, uh, even the questions so that you can hear the sharing at the workshop uh, in a much more effective way. I've uh, adapted the... Uh, Prayer of St. Francis to our time together here about principles for alignment. Spirit of the universe, make me a channel of your peace. That where there is hatred, I may bring love. That where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness. That where there is discord, I may bring harmony. That where there is error, I may bring truth. That where there is doubt, I may bring faith. That where there is despair, I may bring hope that where there are shadows, I may bring light, that where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that one finds, it is by forgiving that one is forgiven, it is by dying that one awakens to life, and adopts a spirit of welcome. I think that was one of the principal takeaways for me today. You all really responded to that and expanded on that. So the spirit of welcome. I think if we have that in our life, our life's going to have a lot of quality to it. So thank you so much, everybody.